symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course we couldn't do it without the hall of famer, the greatest professional wrestler of all time, your friend and mine, double J Jeff Jarrett, Jeff, how are you, man? Oh, oh. we are about 48 hours late and, and running, but, uh, I'll say that right off the top, put it all on me. Conrad, as usual is ripper and ready to go, but been a little busy, a little busy, uh, skunk gank going on. I've, I've, I've chuckled a few times getting on Twitter, looking at the different, uh, 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 just all the names, the skunk in a cell and, and smelling the selling the smell. And, uh, anyway, all that, but we're late. Uh, but boy, oh boy, literally just walked in. It is a Thursday morning as Conrad Thompson likes to say, as we were recording this. So we're two days late dropping it, but just got off the plane from Houston. Uh, a hell of a night last night at dynamite down in Rosenberg, Texas. You ask, where's Rosenberg? Well, that'd be a suburb of Houston, Texas. So that, and uh, when I get done recording this, Connie, uh, I'm headed down to old stomping grounds of Memphis, and um, the fun never, ever stops. Does it, pal? There's so much to talk about before we get to our topic. Our topic today is the NWA 70th anniversary show. Uh, I guess maybe the last major wrestling show that happened at the old Nashville fairgrounds back uh Back when it was called the asylum once upon a time, but real quick, I want to just start at the top because we got a lot of things to discuss today. Go Vols. Shoes, shoes, baseball, a oh lot of chatter God. this past week, a lot of chatter. And I saw that you had like, you were behind a podium. You were speaking. What's going on with your, uh, your baseball habit. You know what? Uh, my baseball habit, it, it is something that, uh, Karen chuckled at me. She said, you love going up and, and doing that and, and, and being a part of it. So as, as a part of my monthly duties, um, uh, Springfield lucky horseshoes, uh, the parent company is called golden rule entertainment, but, uh, Jamie tool, my partner, he put on the first, uh, annual, um, it's called, um, oh my gosh, uh, the summer ball summit. Uh, mm. and, uh, Conrad, it was, um, it was really, really cool. I, the best way to describe it, it was a three-day workshop. And for folks that don't really know what uh, summer collegiate ball is, it is uh, up until, I don't know, four or five years ago, uh, Major League ball, Baseball, uh, they, uh, you know, every Major League team had around six minor league cups, triple-A, double-A, single-A, and then high single, low single, all that. But – they have uh, constricted and constricted. I think at one time they were about 180 teams and they went to 140, 120. I think they're around 90, probably going to go. But it's opened up opportunities for leagues like us, and they're exploding because we play uh, 64 games uh, every summer, and all of our kids have to be enrolled in college. So when they finish their – an incoming freshman can be on the team. But when they finish their season in college in, in the spring, they report to us – play all summer long against really, really. So it's kind of all-star college teams, guys that want to get drafted. So uh, nowadays college facilities are nicer than a lot of uh, minor league uh, facilities. So it's working out. But um, the summer ball summit was GMs, owners, um, directors of anything from ticketing to social media, but we all uh, converged in Springfield, Illinois and, um, like I said, a three-day workshop on just uh, about everybody I've talked to. I'm like, now, why are you here? And they all say, I want to go away with two, three, four, five golden nuggets that will help my revenue next year. And so that's what it all boiled down to. So I was uh, uh, I was very honored. I got to kick things off and gave a, uh, a opening chat, um, hit the time just about perfect. Uh, but, uh, my, my, uh, my opening speech was kind of the four pillars of live event promotion and got some great feedback, but it's a lot of fun. She's baseball's off and running. We've added two teams to the prospect league. We're up to 18 now. So enough of the baseball, Connie, I appreciate, you know, I've actually got my, uh, slap nuts, uh, horseshoe shirt on, but, uh, it was, uh, it was good. It was really, really good. Um, we're, we're looking to expand in Golden Rule Entertainment, looking at a couple of teams. I got another trip next week to another market. So a lot going on in the world. And, you know, Connor, I don't know. You're just down the road from us. You hear all the buzz about Major League Baseball 
they're expanding by two teams. I kind of think uh, Nashville is uh, not at the top of the list, at the tippy top of the list. It, it's got to be. I mean, Nashville is such a boom town. It feels like it's going to be a natural fit. And, uh, well, that'll be another team from Tennessee that gets that ass whooped on the regular uh, because we're going to be doing a lot of that down in Tuscaloosa. Uh, the city of Tuscaloosa actually knows that fact and uh, made sure to post about it over on Twitter, uh, or actually it was Facebook, but I was sure to share it. Uh, so if you haven't already, be sure to check that out at, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad, the city of Tuscaloosa, as you and I are recording posted yesterday, please be advised that in light of this week's game, we're preparing for an increase in crime reporting throughout the city. This is due to the fact that Tennessee fans are low down and dirty and they some snitches. I just love uh, so much college football, especially SEC college football. It's what I was reared up on, as my dad would say. And this weekend is a really special rivalry game. We've had a lot of talk here, a lot of tongue in cheek chatter, if you will, about that game. I'm a uh, two decades long season ticket holder to Alabama. And now our daughter Morgan uh, has a 4.0, made the Dean's list. Uh, and playing tennis down in Tuscaloosa. So. Uh, congrats on that. Yes, and if my wife says, uh, T-Town be getting them dollars. That is not cheap. Uh, <laughs> so we're sending our money in all kinds of ways to Tuscaloosa. Meanwhile, you, just like me, you can't help it. You were raised as a volunteer fan because your dad was a volunteer fan, and I'm sure his dad was a volunteer fan. And this becomes generational, and it's been passed down. And like poor Cody until last year, he had never actually seen Tennessee beat Alabama. Oh, here we go. Here we go. And this year, it's a little bit of a different circumstance. Uh, we're not playing in Knoxville. We're playing in Tuscaloosa. And I can't believe this is real, but Alabama is an eight and a half point favorite. Mm. As we're recording here. I thought that was way, way high. So glad I'm getting the points on this deal. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> no, no, okay. Go backtrack. Nobody, no, no. Mr. Thompson, no. you and I have, have thrown it out there a few weeks ago that we're going to make a bet about this game. And we Easy. encourage people to use the hashtag double J bet. And we had great suggestions. Some of the suggestions included a strap match where, you know, whoever lost had to take some lashings and you were quick to say it doesn't hurt. I don't know that I really want to find out, but <laughs> there was an idea. Another was that Jeff would have to use the Alabama fight song as his theme music one week. I don't know if that's even possible, mm -hmm. uh, but if Tennessee would win, then I had to use Rocky top as my podcast theme for the week for all my shows. I don't really want to do that. I, I really like that one. I don't really like that one. Uh, how about if Alabama wins, Jeff has to dye his hair black. And if Tennessee wins, I would have to shave my beard and mustache. I don't think either one of us want that one. Not going for that, pal. You're a snitch. Uh, you're low down and dirty. Everybody knows. Hey, uh, real, real quick. Did you post that video on your social or ad free or? I will. I will today. Just so people get the reference. Yeah, I was going to say. It's about a 15-year-old clip of an Alabama yeah. fan who is dead serious. And yeah. he, that's where this whole thing kept. So a 15-year-old video clip is is become legendary in this yeah. the Alabama rivalry and the city of Tuscaloosa showed their true colors and how ridiculously juvenile they are like all Alabama fans that they just can't they just can't help themselves they fumble over the oh go ahead we, we, you were going in the bets but truth be known we're going to play that on hey hey it's Conrad or my world we yes. got to get that clip out there cuz it it will it will it is a real microcosm of the rivalry. Oh, no, no. Just to how ridiculously moronic Alabama fans are. People oh, wow. Okay. That. The people, that'll be the takeaway, but go ahead with your bets. Bye. I guess we, just, we need to make a, we need to make a call here is what it is. Um, I mean, what, we had some great suggestions like this one from David, the loser has to eat Eric Bischoff's dry Turkey. No way. Right? I'm a strict diet, pal. Uh, loser must cook the winner and their spouse a big steak and serve it while wearing a maid's outfit. 
I there's some interesting ones here. You'd like me in a maid's outfit. But I, I like I like this one. Loser has to attend an Alabama or Tennessee game and root for that team mm. with the jersey or something from that team. So what I'm suggesting is, mm. why don't we do this next year? So if Alabama wins, when Alabama wins, when, when, next when, year. When you say win, I want to make sure I'm getting eight and a half. No, no, no. Straight up heads up bet. That's what you agreed to. Don't you, but you're a heel on TV, but not in real life. <laughs> that can slip. That can, that can switch. All right, go ahead. You're going to wear an Alabama Jersey to a Tennessee home game. I'm going to attend with you and maybe we'll get like a little tailgate organized for some of our ad free shows, family members. All right. Now I can, okay, hold on. Now, I, now the opposite would be if Tennessee wins, I have to come to your home stadium wearing the biggest orange jersey I could find. Do you know how much that'll go viral? Yeah, me know. me and uh, Captain Roll Tide. I mean, that's what people know me as. Yeah. Like, yeah, that would be a, that would be unfortunate. But it would also allow us to 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 hang out with some of our big that's, supporters. I, that, that goes to the top of the list. But let me ask you something. Instead of just a jersey. Hmm. Can we say that the winner gets to dress, and I'm saying with, within reason, but I'd love to see you get some like size 18 orange shoes and some checkered board pants and maybe one of those oversized hats. I, I want to go full in gimmick, full gimmick. I was gonna say let's re, let's wrestling it up. A jersey you will kind of blend in. Okay, all right. I'm with you. Full gimmick. All right, we'll go with that. The over loser. The the winner gets to dress the loser almost like a mascot. And let's take it a step further. Gets their face painted. I'm in. I cannot wait to see. <laughs> Cause I've seen you and sting face paint before. That beard is going to be checkerboard, orange and white on your beard. Dude, yeah. that sounds fun. I'll be honest. I kind of <laughs> wouldn't be against that. All right. So that's the bet. We're going to be attending the game next year and the winner will get to dress the loser. Hey, um, right, just something just came to me. Remember my old promo about the, uh, the giant? You will yeah. not choke slam me. Yes. Conrad, you will not make me wear an elephant's head with a big tusk <laughs> flopping around and an elephant tail. <laughs> Can you? I. You know what? I'm gonna have. Oh, you, you're gonna be taking a dog and walking him around the state. You're gonna have your smoky. Bird, smoky. Yes. Uh, yeah. All right. Listen, I'm for it. <laughs> I, I'm ready for it. You know, and here, here's the dog. We're going to make sure that we put it in a Joe Burrow jersey. Uh, <laughs> although I will tell you this, people, there's some loose lips. I saw on social media What's where that? someone said that they uh, did very well in their fantasy football this past week. They even said they went so far as to say that they may have skunked their opponent. I win every week. Wait, who, who who's chirping? Well, let me just say he's known to dress in stripes. That low down, dirty, rotten scoundrel. And he's some snitches. He's a snitch. Damn he bear. How do you even say that Fruit Loops name? All he had to do was literally just move the ball like 10, 15 yards. And I win. I absolutely got it's robbery. It's it's total. I've it's up for I've uh, I got the commissioner looking into this. It'll be overruled. Well, I hope we have a commissioner and maybe some medical personnel on hand because as I understand it, you and I are recording on a Thursday morning, but this Saturday night, Oh boy, here we go on the heels of Alabama whooping that ass, which we all know is going to happen. Okay. You might tote not one, but two ass whoopings in the same day because the rumor and innuendo is that you're taking on Eddie Kingston in Memphis this Saturday night. So Connie, a little inside baseball, right? I've been home a grand total of 40 minutes, maybe came in, unpacked my bags. Uh, when we landed me and Karen, she had her car. She went on ahead. I had to rent a car cause I'm driving to Memphis. It's going to be easier. 
So she's a little bit in front of me. So she made me some oatmeal and all this. I got home, had to check the traps. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Had, <laughs> oh, Conrad, this, this skunk story is, it's, uh, it's not just smelly, it's messy. But anyway, and um, who do you think met me at the door and said, uh, hey, Eddie Kingston, he's going to take it to you tomorrow night. I said, Cody, that would be Saturday. That that would be yeah. Saturday. So we have a, uh, our household is cranked up. So Conrad, who would have thought Monday night? Now, look, I said it by design from all those Monday nights ago, Saturday night, Memphis, Tennessee, the last outlaw, Eddie Kingston, Memphis street fight. Didn't have that on your bingo card uh, this week, did you, pal? Dude, you know what's crazy is I know in real life that Eddie Kingston's two favorite types of wrestling are King's Road, all of the the four pillars, if you will, you know, the Masawas and the Kawadas and, 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 and all the legendary action from Japan, but also Memphis wrestling. You know, that's where you really got a lot of the hardcore and you got a lot of the storylines, you know, of the... A lot of professional wrestling at large owes, or you can trace those roots back to Memphis. And for my great close personal friend, Eddie Kingston, oh, please. to be able to finish what I start with the Alabama Crimson Tide in the afternoon. Boy, that, boy, are we feeling frisky. For you to tote a double cheeseburger of an ass whooping on Saturday night, and for him to know, you know, the descendant of, of one of the greatest professional wrestling promoters. I mean, an industry changing pioneer and business partner of Jerry, the King Lawler. And he gets to whoop his ass on live TV in Memphis. I'm just so happy that Eddie Kingston has this opportunity. I mean, you know, in a weird way, this might actually be, and maybe we should see if we could get this domain right fast. Jeff Jarrett's last match.com folks come see it. It's this <laughs> Saturday night in Memphis. Tickets are on sale now. AEWTIX.com. This could be your last chance to see the last outlaw because I've seen Eddie Kingston come to the ring with a can of gasoline. And respectfully, Jeff, you ain't ready. You're going to go in frustrated and pissed off because Tennessee will have embarrassed you. And you're going to know you're going to be dressed up in all crimson with face paint and all kinds of silliness a year from now. And you're going to be distracted. And he's going upside that head and you're going to walk down that ramp, but you're going to limp back up it. It's going to be bad for you. Well, if I, you know what, Conrad, you are talking a tough game. You know what? It was probably, I don't know, a month or two when the last outlaw strolled into AEW. And I found out firsthand Eddie Kingston's affinity, the first VCR VHS, my bad VHS trading tape he ever had. Right. Look, like you, you know him well. Yeah. Because of that. Japan and Memphis. But he talks yeah. about Memphis bloodiest brawls. Mm. And so he, he is quite the historian. Yeah. So I get to write kind of the final chapter in that. And, um, you, you know, Conrad, when I first went to WWF, the agents were Chief J. Strongbow. Uh, Jack Lanza, Rene Goulet, Tony Gurria, uh, Hebner's, but Dave Hebner, he didn't hand out finishes. I'm just trying to think of the ones that actually, I, I think those four handed out the finishes. And you walk in the dressing room and the different cards and the different tours and everything, and they would come up to me and want to give me the finish. And it kind of became a running joke that they would say, <clears throat> Hey, Double J, uh, do you mind? Oh, and I would say we're a little close to Memphis and they'd mm. say, I've changed my mind. I'll get back with you. So Conrad, not being a little close, they but should, in the city of, yeah, they should call this the bill street brawl because on bill street, the Bronx little bitch known as Eddie Kingston is going down. He has no idea what he stepped into. He's going to wish he never, ever, ever watched one minute of, as they say in Memphis back in the day, Channel 5 wrestling. You know, it wasn't CWA, wasn't USWA. If you were a local, hey, man, he's on Channel 5 wrestling. 
That's when you know you're local. It's not this CWA or championship wrestling or wh whatever it is. Hey, he's on Channel 5 Wrestling. So he's going to find out what Channel 5 Wrestling is all about. I'm pumped. I really am pumped. I'm, I'm going down to tomorrow to do a, a, a leaving tonight, Thursday night. Going to be doing a full day of media tomorrow. And then Saturday, wake up. <sighs> Watch that nice ass whooping. Go Big Orange. Are you going to update your will before you do this? Oh, God. How silly. Like, seriously, we need to get key man insurance on you with the podcast because there's a good chance that. Here, here we go. Bunch of you could be incapacitated. Like, I'm just telling you, man, you're not ready for this. Speaking of incapacitated, no. Mm -hmm. God, Rand, I'm getting me some uh, iced tea right now. Oh, wait, wait. Don't. Are you going to. Are we going to talk about what I think we're going to talk about? Well, Conrad, not many times do I try to. I have had more feedback. Are, are, are we hang, going on, to, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Before we get into the meat of this conversation, oh, no. and I know we're going to be talking about the NWA 70. I just briefly want to say, if you're looking for wholesome, convenient meals for a jam-packed fall season, Get Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, and get eating well off of your to-do list in just two minutes. Get 50% off Factor with code MYWORLD50 at factormeals.com slash myworld50. That's factormeals.com slash myworld50 and use the code myworld50. Now, Jeff, we had a bit of a conversation last week about, oh my gosh, what are we looking at here? Do you see what that is? Do you see I mean, that? It looks like you behind that, bars. That graphic, did you? Yeah. The, you and your, your minions, whoever it may be, which is just complete nonsense. Having a lot of fun with that, aren't you? Well, here's what I know. You've been trying to, as we like to say, trap that thing. <laughs> and when we spoke most recently, you were telling us stories about how on more than one occasion, you've made your poor, lovely bride Oh, stop. Take all the household animals into the shower together because the skunk would come out and spray all of your animals. And this skunk has wreaked havoc on your family at this point for months, even from before the summer months were here. Yeah. And you were exploring different traps. And I understand that we're actually going to be over on the My World social account. So if you follow us on Twitter, you should definitely do that. It's at my world pod. We're going to post some videos of all the different things you've seen because you leverage some technology. You set up cameras to try to catch this thing. Where are we at today, Jeff? So I shouldn't say much to my surprise, but the queen, Karen, she got wind of the, the details that we kind of talked about uh, on, on the uh, trap that thing, uh, skunk gate. Conrad, she refreshed my memory, and I don't know how long would you, you really want me to get, but I'm going to tell you one. I, I'll tell you a couple of quick stories because that movie Caddyshack and Bill Murray, if you could just kind of imagine Bill Murray, for those who hadn't seen the movie, go out of your way to see it. It's an all-time classic. but. That's been carried. She's had some restless nights, some sleepless nights on this. But to tell you how far back this goes in this round, and Conrad, you're very descriptive. Can you describe a bad, like, fresh skunk spray, how bad it is? Imagine. It's, it's um, putrid. It's bad, bad. It, it, it's, uh, imagine, uh, we've all been sick before. Imagine that, but with a wild animal. And one that you can't wash off. Well said. It does yeah. not go away. Yes. The, the, there, there, there's no amount of, well, I'll just go put some dove in my hands or some dial. And, it work. No, that, that's not a thing. That's not going to work. It is our poor dogs. It, I mean, we scrubbed. So you knew it couldn't be on there, but the smell anyway is awful. So Conrad, I don't even think you know this story or listeners. Cause I've kept to, I, you know, Conrad being my partner. He, he checks in. He doesn't really care how I'm doing. No, not at all. Doing. Okay. 
did you did you did you get the skunk? And over the last week, ten days, two weeks, I send him at about six thirty a.m. Save him a.m. because I wake up and I check. All right, did we get one last night? What did we see on the cameras? What didn't go in the trap? What didn't go in the trap? But Conrad, back in the summer, and I because we've got photos of this. I didn't even tell you this story. My buddy had dropped a. Um, uh, this is before we hired the, 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 the company to come in and take care of, cause they, anyway, they've torn stuff up, but anyway, Conrad, I, so a skunk was up closer to my house, not the water this summer. And Karen y yelled at me and said, Hey, he's, there's one uh, up by the fence. So I went out the front door and around the back door and Conrad, I just, I'm like, all right, let's try to catch this thing. I set a skunk trap almost right in the middle of the yard because the skunks was starting to walk down there. They call him a juvie. So it's a, it's not a full grown one. Conrad, this skunk that later has come back to terrorize us, walked right at the trap, smelled the food and then kept walking. That's how far back this trap that thing goes. So, but I got some fascinating news and I'll just give you the cliff notes because there's too much over the last. So seven, eight, nine, anyway, you guys get the drift over the, since the last recording. And then a little bit before that on our security cameras, we have seen skunks, possums, Foxes, a deer, lots of squirrels. And did I say raccoons? No, you didn't, but you did now. Raccoons. So I just, okay. I, I, I don't, cause I, right, people are going to be agitated. Jeff, just tell the damn story. Okay. Conrad last Sunday, Saturday or Sunday. Cody wants to go fishing. Now this is in the middle of skunk gate. So it's all, it's an ongoing thing and everything. Boy, he so, caught some whoppers too. I saw him on social. Okay. <laughs> okay. So right in the middle of all that. So imagine this, Karen and Cody don't have patience. So they head down to the dock and I'm, <laughs> I'm getting the fishing poles ready and everything. And I hear Karen scream, Jeff. And Cody's already on the dock and I come around the corner out of the storage walk about, I'm like, what the hell's going on? She goes, come here, come here, come here, come here. So Karen and Cody were right at the, before you, uh, walk on the bridge, go out on the dock, they were there. And then they walked and then three dogs and a cat are right on the bank and they're close C Conrad from next door out from under this side of this wood pile or brush pile. A big ass skunk comes running right at Karen. I kid you not. And the dogs who were not paying attention and the cat and runs right past them. And about three feet later, it goes right under, uh, the, in these rocks and trees, uh, but under this big tree and, and, and climbed under the tree in the hole. And Karen goes, he's right there. He, and I'm like, the skunk is under there. Yep. He's under there. I said, are you sure? <laughs> and she said, Jeff, it, he's, he hadn't been in there two minutes. I said, I didn't say this, but it's, I said, hold my beer, but I didn't, I said, I'll be right back. Conrad, I ran up to the house and you know, those logs that your starter logs that burn like four hours. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Got one of those. And then on the break, there's a bunch of sticks. So I shoved this, um, starter log down in there. I don't know, seven or eight sticks that I could real fine and clog it up the hole as much as I could. Got me some good old trusty lighter fluid. Douse that thing in right there, Conrad, and lit the match. So and you're that. you're hoping you could smoke him out and he would run into the trap, or you were you were smoke you were hoping that he would I pass was, away from smoke inhalation. I was for sure objective number one because this is what you have to do. You have to destroy their homes so they move on. Oh, I got you. I got you. So you can read between the lines. If there was going to be collateral damage. So be it, but the fire wasn't going to be that close to it, but I wanted to at least smoke him out and get him out of here. Just go on. Cause I'm like, Hey honey, when I start this, let's go over on the dock. And if he runs up in the yard, he ain't going to come this way. Let's just start the fire and go fishing. She's like, hypothetically, what if 
you guys were out on the dock and he would have ran out on the dock with y'all looking for revenge. Like Eddie Kingston's going to be this Saturday night. There's no doubt in my mind. First one in the water would have been Cody. No, 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 no. Then Karen. And then I would have thought, Hmm. The last outlaw nose to nose with a skunk. I'd have gotten wet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if Eddie's listening, wear, wear a skunk hat. And you're oh, you're, right. you're, you're going to have an advantage. Conrad, so what happened? Did he come out? This is what's crazy. So, you know, and I had uh, six or seven pretty good size. Anyway, it was a big enough hole and everything, all that. So we finished fishing, go up back to the house, and that log burns for four hours. So it was burning because uh, this happened around 2, 2.30. It was burning when we went up to the house, but the camera's on it. Karen cleaned off the lens and all that so she could p- you know, look at it. As the sun is setting, th- this is the most unbelievable thing in the world. It was just barely embers, but you could, the because the camera has night vision and all that. Jesus, the skunk. Karen screamed. She was sitting in there on, my, in, on, on the couch. You ain't going to believe this. Come look at it. Come look at it. Come look at it. We watched the skunk live. You could see his eyes in there, and he was testing the heat. He came up out of, uh, out of the hole, and I'm like, you got like it. a rising phoenix out of the ashes. Here comes the skunk. True story. And you called him uh, hey, uh, Jesus because you're comparing this to the resurrection at this point. <laughs> he came out of the tomb. Conrad. Oh, gosh. Okay. It gets better. It, it literally gets better. We're like unbelievable. Well, maybe that didn't burn his whole up because he wasn't too worried about. He didn't go out another way or maybe it did. Whatever. I we th- they were In the Jared household, there was... It wasn't real happy. So, and and let me, a little tidbit on this. Karen was adamant in this lead up to the burning uh, of the skunk. Jeff, there's more than one skunk. Karen, there's not more than one skunk. I've done my reading. The the trap guy, there's more than one skunk. There's more than one Honey, okay. Anyway, so Conrad, the skunk arises from the tomb. <sighs> <laughs> about two and a half hours later, Karen lets the dogs out. I, I'm not kidding. Let's the dogs out. I'm going to bed and she comes back in the house, not really panicking or anything. She let the dogs out. She said, there is, it is a weird noise going on down by the water. What the hell's going on? What is going on? And I'm like, I don't know, honey, let's go to bed. We had had a long day. We did. We had done a lot of stuff around the house. Let's, let's go to bed. Let's go to bed. Let's go to bed. She's like, that just, that don't sound right. That made it, she goes, and so now we're in bed and she Googles, what does skunks noises make? She's, I'm not kidding. She played it, but I'm laying in bed. She's playing that. She goes, I'm, I I said, honey, would would you just stop? You're wanting to think you heard this. Right, right, right. About 4.30 in the morning, she nudges me. Gave me a little bit of a, hey, look at this. Because she literally wakes up thinking about this damn thing. Pulls up the camera at about 9.45 p.m., not 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. The sound she heard the night before was the skunk went in the trap, and we got him that night. Oh, wow. You caught the skunk. Conrad, a monster. Big folks, you'll see this on that My World part. The story ain't over yet. The story ain't over yet. So the contract people that come out and they were kind of re- repairing the hole and you have to make sure you put enzymes down where the skunk won't come back, all this. He, I called him that morning on Sunday morning. I said, hey, pal. Yeah, because that's right. I was at church. I said, hey, we got him. He said, great. Do me a favor. I, I, I'm going to come by later, whatever. Keep the traps out, all this. I'm like, we're going to keep trapping. He said, we're going to trap all week. I went. Trap all week. We got the skunk. He said, well, maybe not, but let, let's see what else is down there. Okay. He came and got the skunk, all this. Karen thinks, oh, the next night on the cameras, it's like midnight. Karen wakes me up. Look, look, look. She sees it. This big ass raccoon walks around and around and around in the hole. Click. Now we got us a raccoon. Guy said, that's great. The raccoons can be destructive, more destructive than a skunk. They can get in people's roofs. You want them out of there. Okay. So we got that. 
over the next couple of nights, we see anything from the fox and all the different animals. So Karen keeps saying, Jeff, there's another skunk. Jeff, there's another skunk. Jeff, honey, no, there's not. No, there's not. Welp. <laughs> sure there's enough. Skunk. Sure enough. In the middle of the night, I don't know, night four, here comes this little skunk. It's a little bit smaller than the first one. Boom. Got it. Two skunks down. And a raccoon. And a raccoon. And we've seen a big, beautiful fox and this and that. So right there, the story should end, right? You would, th you would think. Karen's like, I told you so. I told you so. I knew it all along. I saw two different skunks. I saw two different skunks. Where was I last Wednesday? Where was Dynamite last Wednesday? We were in Toledo. Houston. No. We were in, uh, it was Tuesday. We we're in Kansas City. Okay. We we're in Kansas City. That's uh, anyway. So we do the show in Kansas City. So this is whatever. The next night we got home. Yeah. Whatever, whatever it may be. So that would have been two. Got home Wednesday, Thursday morning. I do my routine and everything. About to walk out the door. You know what? I'm just going to check the cameras. On the camera, I'll run in there. Karen was laying in bed because she'd give Cody the countdown. Said, honey, did you check your cameras? No, what? Oh, I'll, I'll show it to you. God, Brad, a third skunk. <laughs> Dude, these skunks have more lives than you do in professional wrestling. What's going on? Asus, Deuce, and Trace. <laughs> so they're the trios champions of, uh, I won't say your street name, but yeah. The Is lake. that unbelievable? But yeah. the guy came, he's fixed the hole, he's fixed the house, his enzyme. I think we're going to be skunk free because we've disrupted everything. And there's a foxhole down at the end of the thing that he thinks we ought to fill up. But anyway, that's trapped that thing. Two skunks and a raccoon. We're going to have, uh, we'll post some of the wildlife videos. So you can take a look at what's been going on. At, oh, uh, yeah, Dave yeah. Garrett. But, um, Let me ask you this. Did, did you get a very nice, uh, text from, uh, Joe Park? I thought it was grouped up. I don't know, but it was just, Hey, he said something to that Jeff, uh, I love having a good time with you, but you're right. Burrow probably won't make the end of the year. He was very conciliatory. Maybe yeah, because he acknowledged that even though they won, it was barely and really through no effort of yeah of, of, of Joe Burrow. And when you break down how many yards, he threw 185 yards. This is the highest paid quarterback in the history of the NFL. And he threw 185 yards, which. That's in the half of the game. That's the that's all four quarters, bud. That's 60 minutes. The highest paid quarterback. In the history of the NFL. Yeah, through 185 yards last week. That's yeah. why he sent that text and said, hey, you and Connie are right. I've been wrong this entire time. Yeah. Well, here's what I need to know. These three, not one, not two, but three different skunks that you've trapped. Can we put them in home, away, and some sort of, you know, color rush jerseys? And, and put them in, let's get little masks for them. Let's get one in a best mask. Let's put one in like a little straight jacket. I like it. So we can do all the different, maybe one's in a jogging suit. One's in an attorney outfit. Let's dress them up and do like an abyss. This is your life type deal with the skunks. You know what? If you really think about it, when you look at a raccoon's tail, it's kind of got that Cincinnati Bengal color scheme in a way. I mean, I think you could make something you, you could, you know, you definitely could make that work. And yeah, because kind of where the Bengals wore the black and white jerseys, you're on to something. I'm you're just saying. I, and I think, you know, when we deliver it to his doorstep, it needs a soundtrack. You know, like I think we, we need to make sure that when we bring it out and we drop it off. You know? <laughs> we're dropping them on the front door. Oh, God, I mean, back in your day, you used to guys in Tennessee for fun. This is real. Fellas, Jeff's age would take a shit and a paper sack. <laughs> and then they'd set the paper sack on the front door of somebody they didn't like, like, I don't know, Mr. Morrell. And they'd light it on fire. 
And then the old man would open the door and he would see a fire on his front door. So he would do what any red blooded American would do. He'd go stomp it out to put out the flames. But every time he would stamp down, of course, he didn't realize that he's stepping deeper and deeper into shit. Yep. Sort of like signing Joe Burrow. <laughs> Let's just drop all of these skunks off at the Monster Abyss's house. Oh, my Lord. Let's get on the uh, NWA 70. We have, I love that. This is. Hey, serious business. Let me go ahead and give a pro tip for anybody who's in the Memphis area this Saturday night. You need to get your tickets at EWTIX.com can help. And if they don't have what you're looking for, can I recommend game time? You see, you shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets for your next big event. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. And I absolutely love it. Jeff, I've never told you this, but not too long ago, I guess it was about six weeks ago, uh, a beautiful musician named Lana Del Rey was playing at our brand new theater here in Huntsville called the Orion Amphitheater. It's a state of the art facility and they've gotten a lot of big acts, but out of all the big acts, including the Dave Matthews band and so many others, the fastest sellout in Orion history was Lana. And so when my daughter, Kansas hit me up the day of the show and said, Hey dad, can you get me tickets to this? I said, well, sure. I texted my buddy Cassio kid and said, Hey, Cassio, Kansas never asked for nothing, but she wants two tickets to this. Do you know somebody or do you have a radio hookup? And he said, LOL, fastest sellout in history, dude. No chance. I had no idea it was sold out, but I'd already told Kansas, no problem. So then I told her, Hey kid, sorry, I guess it's sold out. I didn't realize she sent me a link where there was a third party ticketing site and Jeff, she would have been sitting with her back against the concrete wall at the very top of the venue. This was the highest section, the last row wow. and the tickets were $172 each. And I thought to myself, self, I know what to do. I'm going to open up my game time app and just see Jeff. Not only did I get her tickets, I got her tickets front row on the floor, dead center for 200 bucks. No way. She could have sat in the last row for $172. Or sat in the very front row on the floor for two hundred dollars, guys and girls. That's a real story. It's a real endorsement. Game time made me look like the hero. I had totally missed it. The show was completely sold out. I wasn't just looking for tickets. I wanted the best tickets we could get. Does it get any better than row one? No. It was front row, and uh, I look like the hero. And I give all the credit to Game Time. But here's what's cool about it: they do a Game Time guarantee but they guarantee you always get the best price. You see, if you find tickets in the same section and row for less money, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. I want to recap the last row on this other ticketing site. The last row was $172 with game time. We got the front row for $200. This is the best deal I've ever gotten on tickets for any event. And this doesn't just work for concerts. It works for football and basketball and baseball and comedy and theater and everything else. But I want to recap. This was a same day conversation. The show was at seven. My daughter asked me for these tickets at one. She had them on her phone before two o'clock, two taps. Boom. She was good to go. Download the game time app, create an account, use our code. My world we will get you $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account, redeem the code my world that's m y w o r l d and you'll get twenty dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed Folks, Jeff, our top, go ahead that app because uh, i've got an account on game time easy, True. easy. yeah well it, the i'm always kind of skeptical i mean the travel apps i use all the time the rental that all that those are all kind of got their the airlines. Everybody kind of have their dis, different niches. But when you kind of get into this type of app, I'm always a little leery. Like, okay, is this going to be, dude? It's so easy. I, I don't have to tell you that, but folks, it's the real deal. Simple app, simple easy, and ooh, what deals? What deals? Check it out for real. I think you'll be glad you did. And let's talk about a deal that happened about five years ago. Uh, I'll never forget this show. Say again. You'll never, yeah, it's near and dear to my heart. There are a lot of different little things in here and behind baseball and tidbits we're going to get into it. I'm sorry I cut you off, but yeah, five years ago. Wow. It's hard to believe. You and I are fresh off of at the time StarCast and you helped me put StarCast on fight. So you helped me uh, work in almost a producer role for that show. And 
man, it was like, uh, Cody Rhodes has called it the Woodstock wrestling. Well, that happened at the very beginning of September and fast forward. And here in October, we're going to have the NWA 70th anniversary show. And that's going to be happening in your hometown of Nashville. And as soon as this was on the radar, you and I had been working so closely together. He gave me a buzz and said, Hey man, we got this big event coming up for the NWA. They're going to run in Nashville. I'm going to be helping a little bit. What if we did like a miniature Starcast model? What if we brought some of what worked at Starcast and we did it here and made it a big package? And I said, Jeff, I would love to do that, but I'll be on my honeymoon. So I won't <laughs> actually be able to attend this one. And so you said, well, can you just give us some ideas and can we work? I was like, yeah. So that became the beginning of mine and your sort of yep. uh, working relationship. And I was so, I was so enamored with the all in show and clearly Tony Khan was that all in show really worked as like a proof of concept for what became all elite wrestling. But the, there was a lot of great stars on that. There were a lot of great matches on that, but in my opinion, the best story on that was the 10 pounds of gold story that Dave Lagana helped tell through the YouTube channel for the NWA where Nick Aldis is the more traditional touring world champion, the British superstar, the former, you know, handpicked uh, heir to the throne for impact wrestling. And now here's the story of the chase, dusty Rhodes' son, Cody, trying to achieve the same championship acclaim that his dad before him had the NWA world title. Once upon a time was the prize in professional wrestling. And just that story and that chase made it feel really special. And that night in the arena, and I know you were there before the guys even locked up and they're just, they ring the bell and they're standing across from each other, looking at each other. It was as close to a non WWE Hogan rock moment as you could get where no one's touching, no one's talking, no one's doing anything. And you could just feel the electricity build and build and build. And you see Cody sort of look to the left and look to the right. And I don't know how much of that was organic and how, I mean, cause how can you really plan that spot? Either the crowd's with it or they not. And I know that one of Cody's favorite matches of all time was, was rock Hogan from WrestleMania 18. And the crowd responded in such a way where you just know, Hey, there's something here. And what a great shot with Cody holding the world title after the match. And it's just natural. Well, we got to do a rematch. So we're going to talk about that. So tell me what you remember feeling when you're at the now arena or at the time it was called the Sears arena in Hoffman estates. You're there and have a, a great seat to see this match happen. Did you already know this was in the works? Did you have this in the back of your mind or did you like me and everybody else say they got to do this again? So I certainly didn't. And, and as we kind of dive into this for the record, Billy, uh, Corrigan brought me on strictly as, uh, we'll call it, um, executive producer. I mean, just the production, no creative, um, none of that, but, but just the, the kind of the producer slash promoter. And obviously I had the venue relationship, but going back to Chicago, Conrad. So this is, uh, August of 2018. That's uh, right. and you know, we've gone into this, uh, you know, 2017 darkest time in my life, uh, in, in, in just, you know, personal, personally, not, not so much. It was just, it was a, it was bad year. So everything about, as I sit here today in 2023, 18 was really trying to put the building blocks of my professional, personal and professional life kind of back together. And, um, you know, I had done, uh, the UK, I'd done a, a, a spoken word tour there. Um, I'd done s some different things, uh, Scotland, uh, anyway, just bits and pieces. But when me and you kind of hooked up at, at Starcast, as that, you know, started to roll out prior to Starcast, that had really got my, I'll call it kind of my, my producer mindset. Uh, and when I kind of look at what we just talked about, I'm not losing the sight of when we first met Conrad, me actually even discussing anything as far as me doing anything in ring. It never crossed my mind or your mind. No, uh, it, it just it wasn't in the cards. I say that to say that I was fired up. 
for the StarCast component uh, from day one uh, from New Japan Wrestle Kingdom 9. It goes without saying, fight. I have, uh, I've probably been their biggest cheerleader and everything. I hate their situation now, but I, I really have been just a huge, huge supporter of and a believer in their technology. I think their technology is so great. Um, and so bringing StarCast and fight and all that with, with you together, uh, when Nick called me, and said, hey, uh, I want you to be in my corner. You have been very important, impactful, pardon the pun, uh, a, a part of my career uh, since the day I kind of arrived in America. Um, I really, I was surprised. Uh, you know, I, blown away maybe sounds too emphatic, but I was very, very surprised just to kind of be uh, a part of it because, um I thought it was a, 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 you know, it was a really cool vibe moment for me. This is prior to Hall of Fame, or no, right after the Hall of Fame. So, but, but anyway, when I watched that summer, that story be told between, like you just laid out, between Cody and Nick and all the peripherals, but all on digital, mm -hmm. obviously no TV whatsoever involved. And, um, I, I say that there was a little bit with ring of honor, but, but for all intents and purposes, Nick wasn't a part of ring of honor. And that story was kind of done organically and the stars aligning. And as you said, Tony, which I had no idea, but Jericho being a part of the show, Ray being a part of the show. Um, it was, a um, it was independent wrestling version of WrestleMania in a lot of ways, it but was. in my brain, Cody called um, the the age the Woodstock. It, here's where I went with it. I really felt okay. The digital age of professional wrestling has arrived. Yes, that that to me was the flag in the ground that um, you know young bucks were red hot, uh, and and yes, they had the New Japan and uh ring of honor and i'm not discounting ring of honor tv but still i i think even the guys would say it, their buzz was more off of kind of the new japan bullet club than it was ring of honor so the stars were really aligning but you take that storyline built around a, a title uh that had a lot of ups but also a lot of downs but when you had the right talent at the right time with the right show the right time of year you know traditional speaking uh, Conrad, I may be off base, but wasn't that one of the first shows in the modern era to happen on a holiday weekend? Because prior to that, I think wrestling companies stayed away from holiday weekends, Memorial and labor and, and Christmas and Thanksgiving. That's a different deal, but, but it, it just, all right, we're going to plant our flag in the ground on labor day weekend. Anyway, it was a big deal. And for me to get to be a part of it as a talent in a <laughs> minor teeny tiny role, I just thought it was really cool. And when you kind of saw the vibe in the electricity, that's where my brain went. Okay, the digital age has arrived because people came to this arena to see this match. It wasn't, hey, let's go watch wrestling that, that a lot of folks to independent wrestling do. No, let's go see this match. And I'm not discounting any other thing on the show, but they paid to see that story, no doubt. And it was cool. So Billy Corgan is the person who reaches out to you directly? Yeah. 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 And do you think that, or did he give credit to, you know, a Lagana or a Mike Weber or how does he land on let's call Jeff? I guess what I'm trying to figure you know, out. I, I'm not sure. And I didn't ask a lot of questions, uh, because I didn't know a lot, <laughs> but I didn't know what, you know, you, you heard rumblings of the embryo of a whatever what well, you kind of heard the rumors of that but also went all right so cody is the champ but now nick is under contract i think if that was my understanding cody wasn't under contract to billy right so from a business perspective i go okay we got a rematch coming where are they going with this how's this happening what's going on and so i didn't ask but he reached out and I guess they had kind of looked at different markets. And again, I didn't ask that, but he said, Hey, what do you think? I said, Oh God. I said, you know, there's been talk and there'd been talk it's done now, but there had been talk for multiple years off and on. I mean, even in the dying days of TNA, we had the last show ever at the asylum. 
Mm -hmm. because they had talks of tearing it down there. Well, fast forward to 2018, that building was still standing. And so he, you know, they reached out to me. I made a few calls, uh, and, uh, Conrad, it's cool. When we did Ric Flair's last match in that year, Starcast, what, two years ago? Last that, year. Wow. Last year. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, last year. It's just last year that, yeah, a lot of the same folks were, you know, it's a lot of state, you know, I'm talking about the, the, uh, Tennessee state ground fairgrounds employees. I grew up in that area. I knew, heck, I mean, the concessions guys, the maintenance guys, the facility guys, the, all those employees out there. So it was easy to me to say, Hey, let's go get this building. I, I was curious what the inside of it looked like. Are the walls still dark? And when you have white walls, just the TV component, what are we looking at? So anyway, we were off to the races and I was tickled to death to be able to, to get to play that role. So very quickly, it's announced after, uh, the all in show. Hey, the end of the you have that when it was announced after Labor Day weekend, the rematch. Oh, uh, within the, within like two weeks. Wow. So pretty quickly, because again, that show is going to happen on October 21st. So I think the actual title switch was like September 1st. So you're not giving yourself a ton of time. I mean, I think within the week it was announced that there was going to be a rematch. And, uh, of course we're starting in Chicago. We're going to finish the story in Nashville. And there's been lots written about that. Uh, I do want to talk about that, but first I want you to further outline the nature of the relationship because the observer wrote this, Billy Corgan and Jeff Jarrett are back working together as they've announced an NWA and global force entertainment co-promotion on Sunday, October 21st in Nashville at the fairgrounds will be a Fight TV I pay-per-view. Jarrett is planning on doing a regular series of Fight TV shows where he would book indie names as main events and use local wrestlers in that region underneath. So a lot to unpack there, as I like to say. Number one, where are you planning on still doing something with the Global Force brand at this point and trying to find talent and build some cards and partner and sell them on Fight? Was that part of the plan? So... I'm backing all the way up. I'll just say the spring of 2018, I asked uh, Mike and we had, we had multiple discussions on kind of, Hey man, what do your numbers look like? You don't have to share with me because you can't really can't certain specific, you know, promotions and all that. But in general, he said, Jeff, every show that has any type of promotion behind it continues to go up a little bit more and a little bit more, a little bit more. He said, if it's people, if it's something people want to see now, I knew from Russell kingdom nine in whatever that was 2014, this was coming, but we were in front of the curve there, but now three or four years later, they, okay, we're there. Uh, we're definitely getting there again. This is prior to, but you know, when I saw Cody and Nick in the ring, you go, okay, there's, it's not a, maybe it, it, the age is here um, and you have to buy it, you know, it, it, and again, it was fight was ready for it in 2018. And I, me and Mike, I said, Hey Mike, let's figure out a deal. Um, and I was, as far as the global force brand to cover that, not as getting a roster and the, that, that old business model, so to speak, I wanted to go in and basically say, I'll be the pro production part of it. But more importantly, the marketing um, component of it, how to kind of laser in. Matter of fact, that was what kind of what my uh, chat was on. Part of my chat last week doing the Summer Ball Summit is, you know, defining what you're promoting. And Conrad, you're brilliant at that. But, you know, spell it out, figure it out, and, and go promote it. And so that was the agreement that uh, Global Force Entertainment, not Global Force Wrestling, it's parent company but uh, you know what what do we what, what is that vision and me and mike said all right here here's kind of the deal and nwa 70 was our first real uh you know partnership if you will between fight uh gfe and and, and a third party wrestling promotion but nwa coming off of the chicago show was lots and lots of momentum my friend well, since we're talking about Billy, did you see recently his comments about, uh, our old pal, Dave Meltzer? Connie, I think I told you this, but I left Saturday, went to Rome, Georgia. I think we texted. I was with my daughter Sunday. I went to a Jaguars game and I, I got to share that to you anyway. Uh, Monday I went baseball. No, I, I, but I'll say this, you know, me on my Twitter, 
uh, I saw a reaction to it, but go ahead. So uh, I said a, a lot of nothing right there. Spell it out. He, he didn't have kind words to say. I can't say that I know exactly what he said. Well, the gist was, you know, the, that the NWA is not interesting in, in creating quote unquote melts or jerk off matches. You know, he didn't want to be Did he old. Say that? Words? Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you have the quote? Uh, yeah, I can pull it up for us here. Uh, it, it, this all came through the official NWA, uh, Twitter account too. So uh, if you haven't already, if you're interested in, in what was said, you could find that over at NWA on Twitter. Uh, but I think it was actually born out of an interview that he did. And so after he did an interview where he said, listen, we're not trying to create melts or jerk off matches. I guess someone tweeted that to Dave and then Dave quote tweeted that and said, Wow. Poor Billy doesn't like Omega versus Osprey, Usos versus Owen Zane, Gunther versus Drew versus Sheamus, Danielson versus Zach, MJF versus Danielson, FTR versus Juice and Jay. Not only that, dislikes the talent in those matches. Pretty sure he'd die and go to heaven if he got one of them on his shows. And from there, Billy responded through the NWA account. Dave Meltzer has most certainly built his brand off the efforts of others, but unlike the great wrestlers, he mentions all of whom I respect and haven't said a disparaging word against, although he implies I have Dave positions himself as the expert on what is and isn't worthy of a fan's attention, as opposed to those who actually wrestle or for example, perhaps run a professional wrestling company 365 days a year. The NWA has a pay-per-view coming up on October 28th called Sam Hain. And that's what matters. Fans are arguing over worthy or unworthy champions. That's what matters. And as the lifeblood of the business, restoring the legacy and drawing ability of a company that's 75 years old. Well, that matters a lot yet all must bow to the opinion of one. No, thank you, sir. Wrestling fans from all over the world deserve better than that. That a, that's surprising. Billy has built an incredible, I mean, the legacy of his music ent entity. He's a legitimate, one of the only handful with us rock stars. But, and I'm sure he does have managers and, uh, you know, a label, everything that goes with that. But like, when you really drew it down, Billy has steered his ship for years. Yeah. It's, Billy's been the captain. Yeah. Like, Toby, he's not a one man show. He's a singer. He's a songwriter. He's a businessman. He's a, I mean, done it all. Like you unplug Billy from the smashing pumpkins. It doesn't exist. You unplug. Toby. There's certain artists that do it all. I'm surprised he would, uh, that's surprising to me. It, it just, it just is. Um, and the, what was that line? Uh, uh, bow to the, uh, to one or something. The opinion of one. That, that that's interesting. I, I, I don't think you or me or a lot of other folks bow to that. It, we, we have fun with it, but, uh, whole lot of chatter as Dave green says, man, that is, a, I bet that comment created a lot of chatter. What do you say? <laughs> oh, I'm sure it did. And, and there's a lot of chatter about the NWA now as, as we're recording this, there's certainly been rumor and innuendo that they've got a new television deal coming. I don't think there's been an official announcement from from Billy or the NWA yet, but I'm sure we will cover that. And to be clear, I know that tribalism exists in wrestling, but let's just all agree. If any wrestling organization, whether you like their letters or not, uh, any organization in wrestling that does get a television contract and get some sort of new revenue opportunity, that's great for the business and the performers within it. So I hope if that does shake out that, uh, people check it out and try to support it because you never know. I mean, Listen, without the NWA opportunity, and I'm not saying this is all the way it's, it, it shook out or, or how it shook out, but pr prior to the pandemic, let's not forget the NWA had Homicide, Thunder Rosa, Eddie Kingston, Ricky Starks, and a guy named Eli Drake. And maybe you know him under a different name these days. Yeah. But they were all there. And they had an opportunity to continue to chase their dream and, and pay some bills and live to fight another day. And now they're all doing wonderful on the other side. 
of the pandemic. And, and granted, they're all with different companies and have different three letters associated with their name. But let's not say that, you know, some of that other stuff didn't, didn't matter, didn't count, didn't give them an opportunity to hone their craft. Like it is a net positive for wrestling. So I hope that oh, gosh. Maybe, maybe you do have your opinion about the NWA or what the product is. And if you want to be critical of it, whatever. And I appreciate what, what Billy said, but let's also appreciate goodness gracious. A lot of people got a lot of opportunities and hopefully we'll continue. So I the, yeah. it. That's, it's just, I don't know, but I maybe sometimes just, I'm so grateful that, uh, where I'm at in life. And I guess you could say my perspective and my experience and, and, and when people look, everybody is, has a right to their own opinion, but when people say, Oh my God, I hate tribalism and wrestling. I just go. Now, wait a minute. You're mad that a fan is so passionate that he likes one brand and doesn't like another brand. You're trying to control what a wrestling fan likes and dislikes. Can you imagine Roger Goodell saying, I cannot believe it. This green Bay Packer Chicago bear rivalry. I've had enough. I I've just, I've, I've absolutely had enough. Listen, bears fans, listen, Packer fans. Y'all are all going to meet. And you're all going to shake hands and you all buy it. It's, it's going to become a law in the NFL. Packer fans, you have to cheer for the Bear fans. Bear fans, you have to, like, what world are we living in, Johnny? It's a little crazy. It's a little crazy. <laughs> it's but kind of, it's, it, the world go around and I get it. But as a promoter or a, or, or a lifer in this business, I'm damn happy for impact no matter what they think of me, I'm happy for NWA. I'm happy for WWE. A, it's all good for the industry. And and it just, you know, we didn't even uh, touch on CML last night, Conrad. I kind of, um, and I'm going to post this picture, but uh, me having the opportunity. So CMLL, I guess that's the oldest promotion in, in the world, Conrad. I, I don't know. I think so right tagline over a hundred years. So, uh, years ago, early seventies, uh, when my dad was running and gunning and booking, um, Salvador Luteroth, who's now 98, still living, uh, ran the show at CMLL. He fought, he invited my grandfather, uh, my, invited my dad down, uh, to Mexico, put him up at Port, uh, Acapulco for a week with my stepmom, and they had a grand time. And, you know, as promoters do, tra you know, traded thoughts and vacationed and had a good time together. So fast forward, I start working with um, AAA with Antonio Pena early in my career. You know, my dad had obviously wasn't completely dialed into the Mexican scene like he used to be. He's like, now, are you working with him at all? And I'm like, no, let me introduce you to Pena. So we went along all those years and I'm giving you the real Cliff Notes version. But a couple of different times throughout the 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 my Mexico run, my old man would say, Hey man, is there ever an opportunity, you know, um, you know, with CMLL, you know, all that history. And, and I got to bring my dad up to speed on the tourists that come and, you know, and he knew the, the, the kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the business. They own arena Mexico and, uh, another, uh, uh, an arena in Mexico and Pueblo and Guadalajara and they run five days a week and just all the wrestling and done all that. And so, you know, but I've never had an opportunity to work, but, uh, getting to meet, uh, Salvador's son, who's a, a few years older than me, but he was there last night and it's the first time we had met and, uh, Jeff, I think you met the third. Okay. I met the third last night. Yes. That's what, yes. So, so we're third generation. I'm third generation. Yes. And so I, thank you. You're kind of cleaning, dotting the eyes, crossing the So Yeah. I met the third last night, but his father and my father were peers. Uh, and just that, that opportunity, I didn't miss it with the passing of my father earlier this year. Um, it was cool. Uh, Chris Harrington actually snapped the photo very graciously last night because, uh, anyway, I got to see, and, and meet him and the history that goes with it. So, you know, I'm a history and Buffy and a, I love it all, but, um, 
I don't even know. I got I got sidetracked. But the NWA, historically speaking, all promotions, uh, you know, AAA and and CMLL have not uh, been very friendly to one another. You you look over at New Japan and All Japan and, through the years and Noah and all the different promotions. You know, their rival promotions, which I think it's great. I, I'm saying it's great, but at the end of the day, the more successful promotions there are globally by far the better we're all better off wrestling fans and wrestling promoters and we're all better off thanks to our friends at ag1 i know we both start our day every day with one scoop and a cup of water that's it it's going to set us up for success because we know we're getting 75 different high quality ingredients that give us all of the daily nutrients that support energy focus strength and clarity my wife tells me that she notices a difference when she misses it You see, there's an occasion where she oversleeps and she's on her way to the gym and then she realizes, oh, I forgot to do my AG1. She doesn't think she's as productive at the gym when she misses a day. And I know I'm not as productive at the office when I miss a day. I get that three o'clock hour crash. A man, there is uh, nothing worse than your brain feeling like it's just mush and you've sort of information overload and you're not as productive. Well, with AG1, man, I've got that boost of energy I need. I also know I'm supporting my immune system. I'm supporting gut health. You see, this has everything you're looking for. AG1 replaces your multivitamin, your probiotic, and more in one simple drinkable habit. It's a science-driven formulation of all the vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source superfoods and nutrients and ingredients that you need to set yourself up for success. Think of it as like your all-in-one nutritional platform, your all-in-one nutritional insurance. So... Here's the deal. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to drinkag1.com slash myworld. That's drinkag1.com slash myworld. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. So Jeff, they also announced at this NWA 70 show, they're going to be uh, recreating the national heavyweight championship. And along the way, as we get here, we see that there's going to be a WrestleCon in Manchester and Nick Aldis is going to beat Doug Williams on September 9th in a match to determine who would get that title shot against Cody at the 70th anniversary show. And, uh, Meltzer would say they're going to be shooting footage with both men at the upcoming championship wrestling from Hollywood tapings to build towards the match. You have obviously uh, worked closely with the NWA once upon a time when you were first launching um, TNA wrestling, and now you know he's bought it out and, and and he owns it, lock and stock and smoke and barrel and all that jazz. What was it like working with Billy? And you said you weren't really handling any of the creative. So can you more clearly define what you were involved in and maybe what you weren't involved in? I define our relationship, and, and that is something that. You know, the it was very clear. My role was promoter and and produ- production. Um, you know, as far as certainly not anything on screen. They didn't ask me to hire talent. I didn't want to hire talent or scout talent or none of that. That was Lagana and Billy, and you know they had their nucleus. They had their vision of what was going on. Um, you know, the, the, the when I think back during this time. Uh, and shout out to our Cracker Jack um, Philly man, Derek. Uh, as we were doing research on this, Conrad, I was trying to pull some pieces together, but I, and because, it, you know, we're talking about the buildup. What I do remember is the day the tickets went on sale. And I th- want to say it was, I, I wish we, I, again, I wish I had my notes and, and this was covered a little bit more. But Conrad, the day the tickets went on sale, all tickets, all floor seats went within as quick as, I mean, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 45 minutes. You know, I mean, they immediately were gone. And then we were only selling GA. And I knew the day they put them on sale that, okay, this is, you know, th- th- this is going to sell out. It- it's going to, we're going to pack them in out there. Um, because we, and when we kind of put them on sale, we weren't exactly sure how many we could get upstairs and what that was going to look like. Cause as you know, the asylum doesn't have 
uh, big dressing rooms and production wise exactly how much we were anyway, but it was, uh, it was a cool time. And the thing that, uh, Nick and, uh, Williams and just, it was, a, it was a very cool time. I, I want to say, Conrad, did you say Russell, Russell, what was it called in Manchester? Russell Con. They did a Russell Con over there. Yeah. And I think Dave Meltzer went in the hall of fame. That year. That sounds right. That sounds right. Yes, sir. I, I feel like I saw some old buddies, one of them being Dave at this. It was it was the lead up to I mean, you know, it was coming off Chicago and going over there. I think that was the time. Uh I I was the I inducted Martin Goldsmith. Uh it was the reason I was there. So um uh, you just kind of think back of where you know what? I think even though Dave wrote Russell Cohen, I think it might have been for the love of wrestling. It was a WrestleCon type convention. I don't because now I'm like, wait a minute. No, even though Dave called it the Observer WrestleCon, it was just a convention, I think. But either way, I, I think when I inducted him, uh, Martin Goldsmith, um, that would have been, been the same year. year. It's the same year, but it what was it this event? I don't know. I'm trying to think the timing of it all. I may be off, pal. Um, well, Dave Meltzer wrote Tony Schiavone and Jim Cornette will be calling the Cody all this NWA title match on the 21st in Nashville at the fairgrounds that Billy Corgan and Jeff Jarrett's GWF are putting on as the NWA 70th anniversary show. Mike Tanay was also in the original discussions as Nick Aldis in particular has been wanting Tanay to call his big matches and Jeff Jarrett always wants Tanay announcing whatever project he's got going. Cody who headlines the show defending the NWA title against Nick Aldis has said that he was going to donate 100% of his meet and greet proceeds to the breast cancer research foundation. So why didn't, why weren't you able to land Shivani or, or Tanae and how did you wind up on Cornette and Shivani? Well, again, I'm going back to, it was a hundred percent, um, Billy's call, you know, uh, again, I wasn't involved in hiring or, or any of that. Uh, the today conversation, I'm sure if they asked me, uh, just not knowing I would have gone to Nick because he's the one who invited me up in, in Chicago and said, Hey, Nick, it's your match. What do you think? It? And I, I don't even know if Mike was officially contacted, um, because you know, you, you put Tony in there and Tony with Dusty's relationship and the NWA relationship as well. They're probably leaned down that road, but having Cornette there and him knowing the history so well, um, I mean, he just, he know he's an historian and, uh, can, you know, obviously slant toward the heel side when needed, but also, uh, Jim's got a very unique way of making wrestling logic sound logical when it, when, when it isn't always very easy to do. So, uh, it, the whole kind of show as it came together, it felt good, especially coming off the heels of such a gigantic event in Chicago. Obviously, the venue going from the Sears Center, eight, ten, twelve thousand people to the the, the asylum, two thousand people, big difference. But you know, when when you sell the tickets, you know it's going to be a hell of a house. And, and this card, the the rematch, was even more centered on the one match. Yes, the NWA Heavyweight or uh, National Title and other things, but. This was the rematch. Uh, at Ring of Honor's Death Before Dishonor, they had Nick Aldis come out and do commentary for a 10-man tag that featured Cody. And that's when they announced that this match is going to be two out of three falls. This is sort of before people were using terms like the forbidden door. Uh, but you've got New Japan talent working with Ring of Honor talent, who's now working with NWA talent. This is pretty cool. And at the time, just to give everybody context inside the wrestling business, people were saying there's this guy in Jacksonville, uh, but they, you know, they weren't calling it AEW. That wasn't really a thing just yet. We should mention before we get to the show that it draws about 1400 fans. And I think this is the largest gate in wrestling history at that venue. Yes. That's gotta be a cool feather in the cap for you. No. Oh, it's tickled to death. There was more than 14. That's why I wish I would have had that count because I do remember, look, this is an old promoter saying, how the hell did they get that number? It was more. But um, the ticket prices, everything that went with the the, the show, the buildup, um, you know, and we haven't, I don't even think we've talked to Conrad since Nick 
made his uh, presence known on the blue brand. Have we, have we chatted about no, Nick? No, we have not recorded since then. Of course you've been traveling a little bit, but I was going to mention that at the end, but we can do it now. Our, our, our great close personal friend, Nick Aldis, who obviously is in the main event and the subject of kind of what we're talking about today has made his, uh, official presence felt on television for WWE. I think uh, it's been reported that he was working behind the scenes for quite a while as an agent and producer. I guess they have a more formalized and official agreement now. I'm not sure how that works. I've heard at times guys like you, Jeff, have an office job and then you have a talent contract. I assume he's doing the same thing. I haven't asked because uh, that's just not what you do. Uh, but we, we did see him make his television debut for WWE this past Friday on SmackDown. And, uh, that's pretty cool, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see him back where he belongs on camera. Well, and see that my, my point kind of bringing that up because it was flashing through my brain and I'm going back to 2018, right, right there that, you know, it, it, as far as I'll call it Nick's in ring career, he had pulled the weight of the NWA for, for, uh, quite a while at this time and, you know, yes. had his ups and downs and impact and, you know, global force, uh, the, the short lived, never got that sucker off the ground, but I was a huge believer in him there. Timing is everything is where mm -hmm. I'm going with all this, but the old Randy Savage mentality that he told me a number of times on different lessons. And I'm glad that Randy, a lot of times told me not the same story, but kind of the same thread and mentality over and over and over. And it was just like, dude, you know, I can't do a macho man, but his mentality was stay in the game. Um, you know, you don't always have to be on the field, uh, but be around, be engaged, stay in the game. And you kind of look at the situation and that's not that long ago, 2018, I'm more thinking about producing and Nick is the NWA champion. And then he, you know, again, just staying around, staying in the game. So I am very, and I want to say, you know, publicly, I'm very, very happy for Nick. Uh, he looked great in that suit. Like he always does. Uh, yes. I think, I think um, there's a lot of upside for both parties. I'll just say that both sides. I think there's a lot of upside and it'll be one of those things. I'm excited to see where um, his career goes from here, but, uh, very, very cool. But back to 2018 <laughs> and the buildup. Um, go ahead. Cause we were, you were, I think I cut you off. No, I, I just think it's a cool feather in your cap as much as wrestling has been promoted in Nashville that the oh uh, yeah, high revenue associated, the highest grossing wrestling show of all time is a show that you help promote here. And it was broadcast on uh, internet pay-per-view, of course, through fight. And Meltzer would report that because there was no other broadcast MMA or pro wrestling events over the weekend, that it did better numbers than anyone ever anticipated internally. Did it meet or exceed your expectations? It exceeded. It, okay. It, it exceeded because I still was very conservative on the pay-per-view bias because look, you know, Chicago, um, I, again, when you Conrad, just off the top of your head, how many videos did K Dog Chris put together for that first star cast? Over a hundred? A lot, yeah. I mean, oh, I mean we're, I, we're over fifty for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm saying this star cast weekend, and I'm including that being the show. I mean, the impressions and the awareness were astronomical, especially yeah. going, I mean, they just Conrad and heck, I don't have to tell you people were lined out of that high Regency Schaumburg in every crook and I mean, it was, people were everywhere. So I'm just saying the wrestling awareness that weekend was at a really high. So that's when I dialed back my projections. I said, because no disrespect, but they're paying this show to see this rematch. And there's yes, other right. that, but th that that's, yeah, I was trying to dip. I mean, that's, I, and I mean that with a lot of respect for everybody. So I was conservative. So the fact that it sold out or headed toward a sell out immediately, I felt good about that. But on the pay-per-view buy from a global audience, I wasn't quite sure, but it exceeded expectations. 
Well, it wasn't without a few hiccups. There were some production issues. Billy wrote about it on social media after the fact. On the production side, we feel short of providing a televised event up to the standard that I would consider acceptable, which reminded me greatly as to why people questioned my pursuit of TNA. Put simply, building up a culture like Smashing Pumpkins or the NWA takes time, trial and error, and great risk. And throwing money at the problem doesn't necessarily correct the issues, and in some cases makes it worse. So last night, I was painfully reminded of how hard this journey is and knew by the time the last bell rung, we have much work to do before we'd run such another live event, which is in no way to diminish my appreciation for those who ordered and attended the event. In fact, it increases it. So listen, there were some production snafus. Um, It wasn't necessarily smooth. I understand some of this is just you don't know what you don't know until you do it. Uh, but this was sort of the first big step out there for the NWA, their best foot forward. And he was a little disappointed. Is that an experience thing? Um, enough time to have the team get comfortable with each other. Is it a function of budget where maybe we didn't have the, the budget for different personnel or different equipment or more equipment? Or what do you remember about the production that night and the challenges it presented? For the lack of a better term, Connie, and I've always respect not just Billy Corrigan or, or it doesn't have to be in the wrestling business, but really all business is, you know, you, you have to be concerned with your bottom line and there's no such thing as unlimited funds. Uh, th- there just isn't. And so Billy was always very, very, or is always very, very cost, uh, conscious. And you do learn through the hard way that Billy might not have gone down the road from a wrestling perspective, but in, in especially I call it in the digital age, the I pay-per-view world, even more specifically in 2018, you really get what you pay for. Uh, and that comes with staffing that comes with, you know, old Keith Mitchell, uh, early days of TNA, you know, lighting, you have to have a good director. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it does come sometimes very, very simple. Okay. If you got 10 lights, you're going to have this kind of look. If you double it and have 20 kind of lights and movers and this and that, it's going to go up another notch and you can get so far, so far, so far off the, the chain of, you know, every bells and whistles that you do overspend, but there is a threshold with, with all of production that you, you can get by, but you don't want to do that. And Conrad, probably before my, me and you's conversation on Ric Flair's last match. Um, I'm very proud of the decisions ultimately that you made that we, we didn't overspend, but you damn di- sure didn't uh, underspend. We, so, you know, $66,000 to hang the lights in the ceiling. That's not, not easy, right? <laughs> but 66,000 Jeff. Okay. And I'll never forget after everybody sends me the quotes, they're like, Hey, this ain't too bad. <laughs> I was like, fucking compared to what, what do you mean? It ain't too bad, but Hey, we pulled it off. It looked good. Uh, we were happy with it. And I know you guys were happy with the results here at NWA 70. Uh, I, I didn't mean to I mention the, the cost of hanging the lights again. I guess I just have a hard on for it. And maybe it's because I took some blue chew this morning. My wife's coming to visit me. I'm pretty excited about it. I got a surprise for her. Uh, she's going to be running around the house. I gave my wiener a hot tag, and you can too at bluechew.com. It's going to get you the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. She's going to be surprised when she gets down here because I got traps set all over the house. I've got my cameras turned on, I've got my notifications ready, and I'm going to trap that thing. And I'll be ready. I'm ready. <laughs> What's that? I said, go get her, Connie. (laughs) Oh, dude, she don't stand a chance. It's going to be two out of three falls, and she's putting me over. Uh, It's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office. No awkward conversation. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. It's really as simple as one, two, three. Number one, you sign up at bluechew.com. Number two, you talk to one of their licensed medical providers. And number three, you get your prescription within days. You see, Blue Chew's tablets are made right here in the good old USA. You know, the old red, white, and blue chew. It's prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. 
and we want to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And man, we got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code MYWORLD at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is MYWORLD and you'll receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's show. And your way. Uh, yeah, and your wiener. Listen, it's hard for me to transition from talking about how rock hard you get for Karen and then immediately saying, is it true that y'all's daughter sang the national anthem? Is that right? Yes, that was cool. And the national anthem, as everyone, most everyone knows, not the easiest song to sing. So that's uh, five. Yeah, she's in high school singing that. Yeah, early in high school. She did an awesome job. I was so proud of her just to say, yes, I'll do it. And then yeah. did it, and you can imagine Karen how she felt. It just it was very it was very cool, and yeah, it was. And you know, look 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 at the owner of the 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 of this whole event. It didn't really register with Kira, but it did. But it didn't. Okay, a, a, a legit rock star <laughs> is running this joint, and you're singing the national anthem in front of him. So how cool is that? I, I, I didn't miss that fact. I didn't want to tell her that before, but afterwards I did tell her that. But anyway, she met Billy and Billy was very kind to her. So it was good. All good. Guys, the NWA was hot in here in 2018. Take a listen to this first match. Uh, this is Colt Cabana team with, uh, or taking on Scorpio Sky, taking on Sammy Guevara, taking on Samuel Shaw. Sam Shaw, of course, we know is under WWE contract these days. Sammy Guevara, Scorpio Sky, and Cole Cabana, all with All Elite Wrestling. This is a four-way elimination match for the NWA National Championship uh, Tournament. This is a semi-final round here, and Sam Shaw gets the win, 14 minutes and 57 seconds. Of course, we know Sam Shaw these days is Dexter Loomis in WWE. But, man, this is uh, a lot of talent here, and this is before AEW is even a thing. Looking back with the benefit of hindsight, pretty big opportunity here for a lot of cats, no? And, you know, watching the matches in the asylum that night, it, I mean, it just goes without saying. I, I had a grin on my face because it's one of those buildings that, uh, uh, you know, uh, and I said it in my promo that night, the very first wrestling match I ever watched was in that arena. And so here it is, whatever, 30 plus years later, and I'm promoting a show and the people are still rocking and rolling and always has a special place in that, that kind of deal. But you, our boy, Sammy off the charts, uh, I'd worked with him in AAA in Mexico, but yeah, Scorpio sky, my man, Sam Shaw, who I'd worked with in TNA it's cool. And boom, boom, Cole Cabana. Good stuff. Next up, we've got Laredo Kid taking on Barrett Brown. As folks are listening to this, they probably saw Barrett Brown get absolutely obliterated last night by the murder hawk, Lance Archer. And you've probably seen Laredo Kid bounce around here and there. He's been on some AEW shows, certainly down in AAA and lots yep. of independence, impact wrestling. He's done it all. Jim Cornette on commentary here is going to see a poison Rana. Uh, pulled off by uh, Barrett Brown and Cornette can't help himself and says it's the dumbest move in professional wrestling. Uh, Barrett Brown gets the win though. Uh, three stars according to the torch and uh, it goes 10 minutes and 57 seconds. We should also mention, because this is directly from the observer, I'm sorry, from the torch. Someone came into the commentary booth. He told Cornette to sit down. He said his name is absolute Ricky Starks. He said he's perfect and nobody can be better than him. He said he's about to give his best entrance. A video package then played highlighting Starks to a guitar riff as he was shown smirking and wearing a fur coat and a low-cut tank top. This is the introduction to the NWA and really the world of Ricky Starks, and it's on this pay-per-view. Dude, when you look back, yeah, you got the yeah. beginning of some really big stuff happening on this show. And, and that's where, you know, you look at different cards that uh, – I'm going way, way back, late eighties, early of that little transition, you know, that, that you just super clash. We've covered that on this podcast. When you go, Oh, wow. Iceman King Parsons wrestled this guy, you know, just 
names that pop out. But now in this era, Ricky, Sammy, um, just, you know, th these guys that like, oh, they you just don't even put it in context. So it's cool. Back to our conversation of promotions that put together big events on a consistent basis. It's so good for the business. So good for wrestling. We do a little throwback here. I guess we should mention before the show opened, uh, on pay-per-view, we did like a little fan fest, lots of meet and greets beforehand, including with Magnum TA, who's going to be interviewed here at ringside and talk about how cool it is that, you know, you can't turn back in the hands of time and you can't go back in time, but you can embrace the athletes of the day and encourage them to take their shot at the 10 pounds. And he points out that the winner of the national championship tournament is going to essentially become the number one contender for the world title. And that sets up another four way this time with Willie Mack, Jay Bradley, Ricky Starks, and Mike Pero. Again, this is the semifinal. And what do you know, Willie Mack, who we just saw in there with Samoa Joe this past weekend, uh, on the AEW program, he gets the wind, uh, and, and Ricky Starks was involved in it as well. Uh, next up, we got Peter Avalon. Real quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. Real quick. So, and I don't want to, uh, obviously not this day, but if, if I remember correctly, Magnum TA's car accident was right before I broke in. Um, but anyway, my point being, I don't believe in me and Magnum talk. I don't believe our paths ever cross all those years. Um, and you know, the, uh, so it goes without saying the NWA, uh, Red what hot. was your debut day? Do you recall the debut? April 6, 86. This is uh, October 14, 86 is when the accident happened. So just about so, six months after. Yeah. Just brand new, but I had just gotten into business and, you know, that, that power slam on TBS. And oh, I was a fan, you know, but we had never crossed paths or met until this event. And, um, you know, I, when you see somebody live and he did that promo, it, not, not that, I mean, he was headed toward super, super, super stardom. But when you saw that promo all these years later, you go, wow, that, that, that gentleman has charisma. So it was cool to see that, uh, for me on, on a personal basis, but, uh, yeah, Magnum did that promo and the people really enjoyed it. It was cool. It was cool. Uh, Peter Avalon is going to be in here with Tim storm. Of course, Tim storm is a former champ. Uh, and he's going to get the win over Peter here, uh, in four minutes and 45 seconds. What'd you think of Tim storm as being the guy who really helped set up and, and make the Nick all this run. I mean, I thought they did a great job of painting him as a human being and telling a human interest story. And then, you know, they were off to the races with Nick. What'd you think of Tim? You, you just kind of look, Billy has a vision for wrestling that is you know, we all have that hypothetical. This is what we would do. They highlighted, and I'll say they, I'm probably going to lean into David Lagana, that Lagana highlighted that human, um, the real human element, being a grandfather and, and, and just the st kind of the, the, the story that went along with it. And, um, again, Billy, you know, he had some rough comments for our old uncle Dave, uh, but, you're not going to see uh, Tim Storm get rated uh, any kind of two, three, four, five star match. Uh, he, he's a, a throwback, and so that's Billy's vision. So I I got real quick why Tim had his spot because of Billy's vision of the NWA. And I think you, as it rolls along in the years, you know, now Billy's had this thing four, five, six years. His vision, that's his vision of wrestling. Next up, we've got the NWA women's champion jazz wrestling Penelope Ford, who we know these days is signed with AEW. Yeah. And, um, there's going to be some, maybe some communication snafus. Uh, the announcers, this, according to the torch said, it looked like a three count, but Hebner accidentally hit J jazz's face when he was making the count jazz, then locked in the STF for the win. So eight minutes, uh, and jazz gets the win a two star affair. And at that point, it's written in the torch, Jim Cornette is inside the ring and he introduces Jeff Jarrett, who got a good pop. Jarrett comes out with the NWA national championship and the torch would say, I thought I was hallucinating seeing Jeff Jarrett walking to the ring with the title in the asylum in Nashville. 
Cornette said he's known Jeff since he was 12 and asked what it's been like to see the reemergence of the NWA. Jarrett asked the fans to give Cornette a big applause, and they did. Cornette said if it wasn't for the Jarrett family, he wouldn't be here. He asked the fans to give Jarrett an, uh, an ovation. And Jarrett said he first watched his first wrestling match in this building. He said to be a part of the 70th anniversary of the NWA meant a lot to him and his family. He told the fans that he'd grown up with them and they're his family. And Jarrett said that we're both fans and that's the reason we got in the business. And Jarrett said they have two matches left. He said they have the rematch of the year with Cody defending the 10 pounds of gold tonight. He said it gives him chills to hold the NWA national championship. He talked about winning the Intercontinental Championship in the WWE and the U.S. Championship in WCW. And he said the national championship is a launching pad to the 10 pounds of gold. And he called out Magnum TA, who's going to present the title to the new champion. This is a, this is a pretty cool skit, man. And, and I'm sure you loved working with Cornette. My only wish is we could have found a way to involve him in your Texas chainsaw de- massacre death match. I think y'all would have had a great time on that one. Just give it a little time. We're going to have, you know, I've got some title defenses coming up and I'm, I think it would be best to recruit him as maybe special enforcer and a special enforcer in that kind of match, you know, as opposed to keeping gimmicks out, you keep gimmicks in. So you never know what he'll bring. I know Jim's, he's always been a big fan of, of Texas chainsaw massacre movies. And I'm, I'm looking forward to him, uh, you know, cheering me on from afar. Uh, like you said, if it wouldn't be for the Jarrett's, um, he wouldn't be in the business. So I'm, I'm just tickled to death that he has supports, uh, myself and, and Leatherface and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, Deathmatch Championship. Listen, we're having fun with this, of course, but <laughs> I'm sure you had a blast working with Cornette. Oh, was it fun to see Cornette in show mode again? I mean, because he wasn't a regular fixture in the wrestling space at that point yet either. No. I mean, he had sort of you know played hokey pokey a little bit with Impact and is he going to do some stuff? Is he not? But he was start- starting to kind of wind down his his travel and, and his, his in-ring performances and, and just being around the business. I think he liked just being hunkered down at castle Cornette or whatever he calls his lovely home there in Louisville. But for him to be all fired up and show day had to make you remember the, the good old days, right? But, I mean, at, at, he came and did a music city bowl wrestling show one year and Jimmy is you know, handsome Jimmy Valiant, I don't want to call an an old timer, but Jimmy, it doesn't take him long to flip the switch to, to get into, to, to mode. I mean, he's, uh, he's just a, a, a flip of a switch away. And so when you look, he, he, he's historian. When you see him on Evan, you know, the, the dark sides and the historical, uh, content and, and Jimmy knows it candidly as, as well or better than, than 99.9% because he is a performer and he has, he's just got a different point of view on a lot of it. Not just an historian who's read and studied and wrote about it for many, many years. Jim lived a lot of history with NWA um, starting from taking pictures of, of, of the NWA champion coming into town or him traveling. And then obviously the Watts and the Crockett's and that whole run. And so for him to get up in the ring in Nashville, um, on the NWA 70th anniversary, it, it checked, it checked probably quite a few boxes for Jimmy. And he, he had a, a good time, um, Honing his, not honing his skills, delivering his skills like only Corny can do. <laughs> Sam Shaw and Willie Mack are going to be here in the tournament final now. Willie Mack, after about nine minutes, becomes the new NWA champ. It's a three star affair. Uh, and then we've got the War Kings, which is Jack Stane and Crimson, along with Road Warrior Animal in their corner, taking on the kingdom of Josephus. We've got, got Shannon it. Moore and Crazy Steve here. Uh, that Dane and Crimson win in six minutes and two seconds. Uh, this would lead to Cornette and Road Warrior Animal in the ring announcing that the NWA has another big show planned called the Crockett Cup. Uh, I like the idea of leveraging nostalgia. Clearly, we we went with that with the uh, Jim Crockett Promotions presents Ric Flair's last match, but the Crockett Cup was a big deal, and to have 
you know, the, uh, the idea that you can use that sort of branding, that's a pretty cool idea. And it leads to a, a ringside interview with Dory Funk Jr. Unfortunately, Miss Decker, who we both think a lot of referred to him as Rory and Funk said it was amazing to be here as part of the NWA and thanks the fans for backing the NWA. And then Tony Schiavone joins the broadcast team question. And we've got, yes, sir. Because you, you know this trivia, and I was I was reading the research this morning on the plane. Um, I asked myself, no, you may know this. Who's who came up with the creative concept of the Crockett Cup? You mean back in the day? Yeah, back in the who? Well, I mean, I I, I would assume that it would be. Um, I, <coughs> I assume that would be Dusty. That was Dusty's I, era. That, that's what I, I thought it would be a dusty era. And and I just thought with Cody being in the main event of this show, and it, was this the first time they relaunched the Crockett Cup after years yes. gone by? Yeah, yes. I, I just I, I, look, me and you are history buffs. And, and, and you know, uh, I, I think I just thought it was a I, that thought went through my brain this morning on the plane. I'm like, that's another kind of a little cool not a coincidence a convergence kind of relaunching and cody's a part of it because it's something his dad created all those years ago podcast heat is teaming up with the 14 time women's world champion charlotte flair to help raise money for smile train and you have the chance to participate and win a personalized autograph photo and how about this a 15 minute private video chat with the queen herself by being the highest donor now, with your donation, Smile Train can provide life saving surgeries and other essential care to children in need 100% free. A donation of just $21, probably less than your weekly Starbucks spend, can provide one cleft repair surgery. Without treatment, children with clefts may struggle to breathe properly, often severely malnourished due to trouble eating and many face long-term psychological trauma as a result of relentless bullying. No child deserves to feel like an outcast. So join Smile Train Global Ambassador Charlotte Flair in becoming a champion of smiles. Your donation will provide the gift of cleft treatment. Donate today at championofsmiles.com. And remember, the highest donor will receive a personalized autograph photo and a 15-minute private video chat with Charlotte. Together, we can change the world one smile at a time. That's champion of smiles.com. Okay. Keep WWE, rolling. just so you can remember in October of 2015, they launched the dusty roads tag team classic. Yep. And that, and that was in 2015. So here we are a handful of years later and, and now we're gonna, cause the, again, the tag team classic, they probably called it that and did a little trophy with a boot and all that sort of taking his bunkhouse stampede trophy, but a tag team tournament concept, merge them together and instead of naming it after Crockett named it after the guy who came up with it, the dusty roads deal. So I'm sure that that's probably what they were thinking here. And, um, yeah, it's an interesting concept, an interesting idea. And before we get to the main event, we got a lot of former champions coming out, Tim storm, Colt Cabana, Jeff Jarrett, Jack Stane, Tim storm. He came out twice, uh, blue demon jr. And Dory Funk Jr. Blue and then we say again. Now, just the Blue Demon. And look, we skipped over because I interrupted you. I've interrupted you a lot today, Connie. I'm trying to pull my weight today. Let's not lose sight of our man. 40th anniversary, Mr. Shivani. How about that? Yeah, this coming Monday will be his 40 year anniversary in the pro wrestling business. Uh, he just was. Uh, Announced as being the next recipient of the Gordon Soley Award for the TNT Hall of Fame. So my question, prior to this night, what what had Tony done in wrestling? Which is MLW. A- he had come back and started doing some MLW. That's right. Okay. So well, he had- just done my podcast and then MLW and now this. Got it. I just thought it was, I mean, it's this show. I, I was fired up to do it when it, when I saw it the first time on the list. And as we got closer to it, then the research on Mike. And here, me and Tony, old slappy, old slap ass, working with him last night. Yeah, but no, it was, it was, uh, and for him to be calling Cody's match anyway, another, that's why we love wrestling. Go, on, go ahead. But yeah, all the champions got in the ring. Blue Demon, that, that's another uh, history buff deal. People don't understand. Most of the people, I would assume, listening to this podcast, don't really put the context of how big a megastar Blue Demon 
is, not was, is, but in his prime uh, physically, oh my gosh, mega, mega star in, in, in Mexico. So Nick Aldis comes up first. He's the challenger. He's got Camille with him. Of course, this is uh, very early in her run. Of course, we know now she's been an incredibly long reigning NWA champion before she dropped that title a few months ago. But man, this is one of her first big opportunities in a big stage. Cornette would say on commentary that she's there to neutralize Brandy Rhodes because, again, Brandy did find herself involved in the match in Chicago. Up next is our champion. Cody Rhodes is out next, and he's trying to pump up the fans as he comes down to the ring, and then they're going to do some formal introductions, whereas we had Earl Hebner as the referee in Chicago. We've got Earl's son now, Brian Hebner, as the referee of the main event here. And all the former champions are going to stay ringside to watch this two out of three falls match that Wade would say it's a 37 minute match. Go out of your way to watch it. It's a tremendous match. And Nick gets, Nick gets the win two to one. And he asked, what was better this match or the match at all in? What did you think? You saw both matches up close. You know, obviously you had the atmosphere in Chicago that is really going to be impossible to follow up. I mean, it's a tall order to even think you could get fans that emotionally invested and that hot. And certainly with that many people in the building. So it's probably hard to compare the two, but as far as just from a wrestler perspective, in ring bell to bell, can you remove the, the feeling and the electricity in the air? Can you separate the two matches or is it all about the crowd? Do you think? Well, you know, I'm biased or jaded or I, I don't know what you want to say, Conrad, but for me, and as I kind of look at Cody's position today, nothing is just so hard to duplicate or to follow the, ch the, the, the challenger and he chases and he climbs the mountaintop and wins. Chicago, for that reason alone, you can swap buildings, you can change buildings, you can change the amount of people in there, but the electricity of the chase of Cody on mm -hmm. top of the groundswell of support with, we'll call it the, the, the Bucks, New Japan, just kind of that whole vibe uh, of, of that that, you know, it was a special time. It's just really hard to follow Chicago. And you can say that about, you know, the first time Waller won the title, probably the first time the Hulk or you stone cold. When you have that baby face, who's hot, that the whole world is convinced that they should be champion and should have been champion. And they're still not champion. It's, it's just so hard to duplicate that emotional connection. So for me, and I'm, I, I just think at the end of the day, you can peel back everything. If you still have that emotional connection, you win. It's everything to me in, 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 in what it, it's what matters most. There's a famous song. What matters most it's that's it. It's hard to duplicate. So for me, uh, although I love the in-ring component of Nashville, the two out of three falls, they work that fantastic. And that's not easy to do either because our, our audience is so educated nowadays. One fall, it's over. The people are educated on kind of quick TV matches. So to to do a 40-minute match with three falls, that's, it's just it's more and more difficult. So in ring, it was fantastic. But the emotional connection, Cody climbing that mountaintop and attaining it, man, is that hard to duplicate. It's just damn near impossible. The observer would write this as far as what this means. The NWA title itself was in a brighter spotlight because of all in the promotional work of Cody and Aldous and video work of Lagana. As far as what this means going forward, it's more difficult. Corgan has a name and business connections, but hasn't been able to get a TV deal unless there's something unannounced on the horizon. It's known that he pitched the idea to TBS and some would find historically significant about the NWA on TBS since a very different NWA did control the station for most of the boom period from 72 to when the initials were dropped in favor of WCW around 1990, but nothing seems to have transpired from it. 
most of the top talent these days is under contract to WWE, New Japan, or Ring of Honor, with a few with Lucha Underground and Impact. Corrigan is likely shut out of that talent, as well as CMLL, because they work with Ring of Honor, and lets us a unique deal like Cody, who was a key reason the show did well, as well as it did. That's fascinating to me, because again, this is written about at the end of October of 2018, and we know like two months and change later, AEW would be born and around a year after this show would be the debut episode of dynamite on TBS. So we're about a year away from that opportunity. And the rumor in innuendo, Jeff, is that allegedly there was supposed to be a three match series. Had you heard that? No. And, and again, I'm the, you know, the television component of it, the production side of it, the promoter side of it, not creative. And I had nothing to do with the NWA finances. Uh, you know, there just wasn't. So no, I, I hadn't. And I think me and you've had a conversation maybe two years ago, three years ago, just as it came out of your mouth, I'm thinking, yeah, Connie did say something that there was rumor of, of the trilogy, but. Well, there's a rumor the finish was changed the night before. There's a rumor that there were larger plans at play about, you know, what you could do as a follow up here. Instead, you know, this is going to sort of end Cody's business with the NWA and he finishes up with ring of honor and does final battle a couple of months after this and AEW is born and everybody sort of goes their separate ways. Billy had this to say sitting ringside for the main event. I had one recurring thought, which there were, there were only a few people on the planet. Let's say the number is under 30 who could do what Nick and Cody did last night. Or as I used to tell my mother, this is why they pay me the big bucks, ma skilled, talented people need the right stage and crowd to allow their best. And last night was exactly that. The fans were fantastic pushing Cody and Nick to a place. I think that surprised them. I remain hopeful for a third definitive contest. So it does feel like that was the original plan. It just didn't happen. And we should try to figure out why sometime. Yeah. Um, this was uh, end of October, right? October 21st. Yeah. I'm just thinking in my life, less than two months later, I'm working full time for WWE. That's and at, at this time, it, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't even on the radar. I, in my mind, I was thinking, what, what are the next four, five, six, seven, eight events? I was already, I think maybe me and you had already talked about, can we do what's our next, um, is there, yeah, you know, we, we had some ideas. See, I was going to say, we had a couple of ideas, uh, the podcast conversation. No, Conrad, I'm not going to be any good at it. No, yes. I don't want to do it. They don't care about my stories. A lot of chatter. A lot of chatter. Uh, NWA wrestling fan wants to know what was it like? What was the atmosphere? It's still one of my favorite pay-per-views of all time. I love the NWA champions gathering prior to the main event. Did this feel like an early day TNA show to you? You know what, what the, the question, cause I saw that, what did it feel like the thing with fight and the technology that I was, um, a couple of times during the night thought about is, is this going to translate at home audio wise? Right. There was a rumbling like none other, um, all night. I mean, the opening match, lots of high spots. Uh, it was, it was a well put together, uh, Less than, you know, right, right. It wasn't too long, you know, two and a half, three hours. It was a well put together show. The people in the arena got an incredible show. Uh, good vibe uh, across the board. I was hoping that it would translate at home. Uh, John wants to know where does the NWA 10 pounds of gold rank on Jeff and Conrad's favorite title designs? Uh, yeah, Jeff, you first on that. I know that you've, you've held the 10 pounds. You've held the big gold. There's been lots of other world titles. Where does the the classic 10 pounds of gold design rank for you? Until this is a little trivia note from the last outlaw. Until I met my partner, Conrad Thompson, I really never gave belt design. I hate to say this, but almost I, it wasn't near in my mindset and look, I was a part of, of, I mean, Dixie 
and the Carter family, they, they you know, the TNA title, they kind of took ownership and wanted to, to, to do all of that. I would give my two cents worth. I never, I didn't realize that Conrad was leading the charge. Oh, so you belt of belt. No, just like, I like this, the tribalism in belt, belt, belt. I didn't, I didn't get that. So I never really had, um, a favorite or a non-favorite, but for me, and yes, it's, it's personal to me, but when I look at the IC title that Kurt Henning, you know, so, so that, that, that line, what's that IC title over my shoulder, Conrad, what's that vision or uh, version? It's, called? Just, it's just called the Reggie IC. Okay. I, I, I think that percent personifies just that was the number two belt. And historically speaking, all right, you put that belt on the guy, you're getting him ready to, to, to go to yeah, the, the next level the world. I mean, that, that was that, uh, to take, go back into my childhood. The first time I saw the NWA title, uh, of course, what do I say? Oh, dad, man, that's the world. That's, that's the world title, not a world title. It was the world title. That's how I just always looked at it. I can remember pictures of Harley, uh, black and white photos. Cause my dad would always go, Hey, funk and Harley race and Ric Flair and whatever. But son, let me show you the best world heavyweight champion of all time. And that's Dory. And I, I never, especially in the early days, I didn't like, no, why does he like this one? It's in black and white, you know, all that. So anyway, I always looked at the NWA title as, oh, there is the world heavyweight title. So those two versions, but, uh, you know, 10 pounds of gold is very, very cool and signifies. And I know as, as years progress, um, you, you kind of latch onto a favorite. I think it's, uh, uh, like folks, uh, hairstyles, they gravitate when they feel a warm and fuzzy about it, maybe about design, but an emotion. People have an emotional attachment to belts as well. Well, you mentioned Dixie Carter and how she uh, played a part in designing the new title. We're going to be talking about Dixie Carter and continue our conversation about Dixie next week here on the program. But this episode largely was about continuing part of Cody's story. And that was winning the NWA title, just like his dad before him. But of course, these days he's trying to finish a different story. And we recently talked about that with our pal, Kevin Sullivan on Tuesdays with the taskmaster over at adfreeshows.com. And I've got a clip I want to play for you right now. He needs to win the belt, but he needs to do his, what his father did. If he's playing his father's story, his father put the heels over first, dumped all the heat, all the adversity, I mean, then he beat Brock with a broken arm. I think they're doing it perfectly. And now I think if they go to WrestleMania 40, okay. it's time. Why the hell would you run that video in my thing? Don't you know that contractually speaking, I'm going to talk to Dawkins. Paul Bromwell should never. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Catch Tuesdays with the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, plus other exclusive series like Alex Express with Lex Luger, the Hacksaw Hour with Jim Duggan, Monday Mailbag with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick, the book with David Crockett, and so many more. It's all available now at adfreeshows.com. Jeff, I never know what to expect when we sit down and talk about our topic, but talking about a show that was just five years ago, uh, that you and I were both friends during was a little different and weird and fun. And I look forward to doing this again in the future. I love it. Good nostalgia. I'm very, um, right place, right time. Just the time in my life, uh, it, it fell into place. So Billy, it fit naturally him reaching out. It just worked. I'm, I'm, it's one of those things that I, I kind of look back on it. The, the, the prior year to that, that, that slam anniversary was a special one just because of all the emotional attachment. This, uh, it was a good show. It was a lot of fun. And I enjoyed this podcast immensely today. And I'm also can't not wait to start designing. I've got some seamstresses at AEW. I got some old folks that I different talk to. I'm going to have to start Googling some Alabama, 
ridiculously looking fan. I cannot wait to dress you up next year. Go I big orange. It's going to be a lot of fun. Of course, uh, the game kicks off at two 30 central, which is the time zone. Jeff and I live in three 30 Eastern on CBS. Be sure to watch that, or at least the last couple of minutes. So you can see that not only did Alabama win, but they won strong. That's what I'm predicting. <laughs> I got uh, I'm also predicting that uh, Joe Burrow throws more than a handful of interceptions this weekend and continues to prove what a joke he is, uh, certainly at the expense of Chris Park. Uh, but most importantly, this Saturday night, mm. a Memphis street fight, mm. it could very well be Jeff Jarrett's last match. Yes. Eddie Kingston is coming upside that head. AEWTIX.com. Man, all your old favorites, your old pals, including Dave Brown is going to be in the house. If you're a, an old school wrestling fan or an AEW fan or a, uh, channel five wrestling fan, hey, you yeah. need to get down to, uh, check it out. It's AEW TIX.com in Memphis. Are you going to hypothetically stop by any of our friends establishments on bill while you're there? You think, uh, you know what, uh, again, I'm headed out here in a few hours, got media and, uh, you never know where I may be, uh, stopping by i would love to um you know maybe that's after show get me some rendezvous ribs pal well that's what i wanted to ask because yeah, barbecue is 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 life in memphis and there's the dry rub at rendezvous but there's other people who say no it's central barbecue and like what's your favorite is there one that stands out above the rest are you, are you a rendezvous guy hey you know it's just so hard and i i, I always run this thread on here emotional I mean, I can remember as a kid, Conrad, God, that place been open that long. How long? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, young and, and, um, every now and then, uh, you would see, oh man, those are run to be ribs. Oh, we went by there this afternoon. Um, you know, there's a, there's a Kaufman, Andy Kaufman story, him coming to anyway, it's, it's just legendary. It, they are, uh, uh, Barbecue is life. <laughs> I like that, Conrad. In Memphis, for life. <laughs> and by the way, if you're not a barbecue fan, uh, I know Jeff and I are big fried chicken fans, and he's not able to eat that sort of thing. But let me give a shout out to Gus's too. If you wind up in Memphis, uh, the second best fried chicken I've had behind only G's Country Kitchen. Oh, jeez, I miss G's, Conrad. We got to make that happen again, just for old time's sake. Sometime. I, yeah, I need to do it like on a Thursday because that'll give me a whole week to get that fried food out of me. So. Well, there you go. And, uh, Hey, listen, we're going to be talking about Dixie Carter next week. Be sure to watch Jeff tote that ass whooping this Saturday night, AEWTIX.com collision DVR it. If you can't watch it, cause you're doing football stuff and watch it the next day and invite the friends over, invite the whole family over y'all get together and have dinner at your house after church and let everybody just have their popcorn and see double J just limp all the way home. It's going to be great. AEWTIX.com. And we'll see you guys next week right here on my world. Peace. Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here to talk to you about my friends over at SaveWithConrad.com. Are you looking to get out of debt? Conrad and his team can make that happen faster than me firing the hockey talk man. Wow. And you know that controversy creates cash, right? Do you know what doesn't create cash? credit card debt. Save with Conrad can help you consolidate high interest credit cards and all of your other debt into one low monthly payment. They can even help you get the cash you need for home improvements or anything else. They've helped 83 weeks listeners save 500, 600, 700, even $800 a month. Seriously, your papers are going to go down faster than nitro ratings in 2000. Ouch. And how about this? No house payments for two months. That's right, no house payments for two months. And unlike the dirt sheets, man, the reviews do not lie. With over 1,000 five-star reviews, find out for yourself how much Conrad and his team can save you by checking out SaveWithConrad.com today. Be grateful you did. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo!